And we'd like to welcome all our online family. Hello, and welcome to church this morning. I'm going to invite Kathy to come. Um, going to invite Kathy to come and read the scripture for us this morning with a clean microphone. But before that, let's pray for our offering. Lord God, we thank you for the many gifts that you give to us. The gift of rain is what we are most thankful for right now. We pray that it will continue to cover our land and to bring us out of drought. We pray that the blessings you have poured out on us may be poured out back into our community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bible reading this morning comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 to 26. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. Amen. The band is going to bring a message for us this morning and those words are, we are standing on holy ground. I invite you to sing uh, along with the band as we bring this message this morning. We are standing on holy ground and I know that there are angels all around. Hello again. It's lovely to be here. Lovely to see new faces. Lovely to see faces I've seen before. Lovely to see faces I saw yesterday in the wet lunch. Which, of course, we weren't wet, were we? We were dry. Somebody had created a space where you can go if you want to be out of the heat or the wet. So as Leanne said yesterday, just put another coat on and go and do things. So we did. So today we're starting our sermon series on being an overcomer, choosing to be an overcomer. Are there any overcomers in the room today? Yes, of course there are. You're all an overcomer of something. Every, the first time a hard thing came up against you, you didn't just lay down and die. You're an overcomer. Scripture teaches us 
that through the power of Christ, we are actually more than conquerors. So today we are talking about overcoming some of the struggles that so often entangle us. Today I want to talk about overcoming the curse of comparison. Over the weeks we'll do different overcomers. Today it's the curse of comparison. How many times in our lives do we compare ourselves to somebody else? I am more than guilty of it. Their gifts, their talents, their possessions and even their physical appearance will often cause us to look at that and compare. Chances are pretty good you've done that at some point in your life. You might find one day you wake up, it's a good day. You've slept well, you're having a lovely day. Then you'll go on to a social media platform, be it Facebook, Instagram, whatever, you've, whatever you use. Maybe you don't use it, but often people do use it. And there it is, the picture that you are going to compare your life to. Somebody has done something a little bit better than you. The green-eyed monster comes and you are completely undone. Your whole day is now horrible, even though it was pretty good. The curse of comparison. The fastest way to kill something special is to compare it to something else. It's like when you love your home and you've worked on your home and it's comfy and it's lovely and you're happy to be there. You look forward to going home after a day out or a day at work and then your friend gets a home update, be it furniture or carpeting or kitchen or bathrooms are redone, whatever it is. Now you're comparing your home to their home. And what have you done? You've killed whatever was special about your home because you compared it to another home. And now that space that you once deemed special is now nothing because you killed it. Where comparisons begin, contentment stops. In the history of the world, it has never been easier to compare yourself to somebody else than right now. Social media helps us compare what we have and who we are to the rest of the world. And more often than not, we deem ourselves to come up short. So it comes up, a picture of friends, your friends, they're all your friends, but they're water skiing and you're not. Or they're at the beach and you're at work. Why weren't you invited? What's wrong with me? Don't they like me anymore? No one's texted me for two minutes. It's not good. Maybe your friend has, got, has put up, oh, going on my second vacation for the year and you can't even afford to go to grandma's house. Pictures of friends sitting by a swimming pool or at the beach or bushwalking, mountain climbing, out for dinner. Any of the activities you wish you were doing, and there they are doing it. This is the activity you want to do. This is what you like doing. But you aren't. And the discontent causes comparison. If you weren't already aware of Facebook, Instagram, I don't know the other things, I'm old. But if there is a young person who knows other things, feel free to chirp in. Social media is simply a platform for people to put up their best moment. No one is going to put up their worst moment of the day, unless they're fishing for attention. But the worst moment of the day doesn't usually get a run on Facebook. It's not behind the scenes, rough and tumble stuff. It's not, um, oh, I'm sitting here having a lovely cup of tea. That's snapshot and then in the background one kid's got a bleeding nose and the other kid's got half his hair pulled out. That's the reality that does not make it to Facebook that people don't tell you about. 
It's for the best stuff. It's the highlight reels. It's not the real stuff. One glimpse in time of someone doing a momentary thing does not mean their whole life is like that. It just means they had five minutes peace to have a cup of tea before the house exploded. And that's the picture that you get. After a fancy dinner and all the well-staged photos are put up, no one is going to then put up all the photos of how that dinner did not agree with them. Are they? And there you are, watching the highlight reels and comparing yourself and your situation with a momentary glimpse into somebody else's life. One trip to the hairdresser and a perfectly framed photo of the hairdo does not make for a fulfilled, joyous life. Once you wash that hairdo, it's up to you to make that do what you hope it will do. All we get on social media, as I just said, are the highlight reels. All we get in real life is all the real stuff and the things that hurt and the things that damage. But also we get the things that bring joy and the things that bring happiness and comfort and love. We get all of that. But when you're comparing your highlight reel to somebody else's highlight reel, it's not going to compare. And you know, phones and cameras and things, they have filters. So I could take a photo of myself put a filter over it to look like I'm 20. I'm not 20, but I can make myself look good on a camera. When we compare ourselves, we become miserable. We were once okay with us, and then we compared ourselves, and then we dropped down into being miserable. Because where comparison begins, contentment finishes. It's over. Today we're going to look at Paul in 2 Corinthians. And Paul is saying, we don't dare compare ourselves with others. They are only comparing themselves with each other, using themselves as the standard of measurement. When I read this and I thought about it, I'm like, oh, I'm comparing my humanity to another human equally as flawed, equally as damaged, and I'm comparing that to me, another human. Has anyone else stopped to think they're comparing themselves to another human, another version of them, just with different coloured hair, different height, different coloured eyes? Still a human. So why are we spending precious time and energy comparing ourselves to other humans? In fact, one of the problems is when you compare yourself, two things happen. You become inferior or you become superior. I'm better than them or I'm worse than them. And neither of those situations brings any honour to God. Comparing and bringing about a negative feeling isn't in the plan for your joy of your life. It's not how your life was planned to be fulfilled. There is no winning in comparison. Some parts of our lives, we might want to be richer, faster, happier, better, stronger. Then when we get more carried away, we want to be the richest, the fastest the best, the strongest, the happiest. Is that your story today? Have you been living a life of comparison with those around you? Or have you done it in the past? In chapter 20 of John, it shows us a little conflict between two blokes, very much comparing themselves with each other. Peter and John. Peter and John didn't much like each other. And that's a bit odd. They're disciples. How is that possible? They're with Jesus all the time. They must like each other. Everybody gets along because they're in the disciple group, right? Maybe they didn't exactly hate each other, but there was a competition between the two of them. 
For starters, John refers to himself as the one Jesus loves. I'm the one Jesus loves. And the scripture tells us that Jesus loves us all equally. But John finds it necessary to point out in scripture that he is the one Jesus loves. Very good self-esteem there. He is just assuming that he's the one Jesus loves. The context of this for John was three days Jesus had been dead and he was supposed to be in the tomb. Mary got there, stone rolled back, tomb is empty. She didn't know what to do. Was he risen? Was he stolen? She runs back to them and says the tomb is empty. Christ is risen and John is all excited and he's going to be fastest. He'll be fastest. He'll get there first. So the two of them take off. And when I've read this over and over in my life, I'm like so excited to go and see what's happened until this. Both John and Peter start running to the tomb to work out what had happened and on the way John decides he's going to get there first. After all, he's the one that Jesus loves. He should be there first. So he takes off and he does in fact get to the tomb first. So there was John, probably out of breath, leaning against the tomb, trying to suck in big ones to get his breath back. All chuffed that he'd made it first. He's the one Jesus loves. He's first. And then Peter comes behind him. So what was the most important thing here? Finding out where Jesus had gone or being first? In that moment, for John, being first. The Christ is risen foot race was run and John won and then they went into the tomb. John first, of course, John's in the tomb. John, Peter, in the tomb. And then John, sorry, I've lost my spot. Here we go. So three times John compares himself to Peter. Has to be better than Peter. Firstly, Christ is risen and he's faster. Christ is risen and he was behind me. And Christ is risen, I won the race. John does himself no favours by comparing the two of them. But they both got to the tomb. He just exhausted himself for no reason. And in John 21, the competition goes on. They're fishing out in the boat, nothing on this side. A bloke approaches the shore, they don't know it's Jesus at this time, and says... Throw the net on the other side. So they do that and start catching fish. And John says, I'm the first to recognise him. And then he says, but Peter can't beat me on land, so he gets in the water and tries to be faster in the water. Whether this actually went on, we will never know. But this has happened between them and it looks like a race, it looks like competition. And it's most undignified. Then what happens next is where the power of the story is. Peter has a very confronting conversation with Jesus. Before the crucifixion, Peter was very bold in his love for Jesus. Peter declared that he would always love Jesus no matter what the other disciples did, no matter what the other people said, he would always love Jesus. And then when he's asked a point blank question, he says, no, I don't know who that is. And then Jesus is watching Peter. Peter sees him deny him and is crushed by his own actions. So then we have the second opportunity where he gets to be with Jesus. And Jesus asks the question, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Then Jesus says, Peter, go and feed my sheep. Just as a side note, I find it interesting in this part of the scripture that he denies Jesus three times and three times Jesus asks him if he loves him. That's an aside. During this special encounter with Peter, with Jesus, sorry, Peter turns around and who does he see? John. John's standing there. John, his competition, and he unashamedly asks Jesus, well, what about John? If I've got to feed the sheep, what is he going to do? And something I really like about the way Jesus 
is, is that he's a straight talker. Straight to the point and says to Peter, what business is it of yours if I want him to live until I return? I've asked you to feed the sheep. I'm talking to you. I'm not talking to him. I'm not talking about him. I'm talking to you. This is about you. What we need to understand is that we cannot fully follow Jesus if we are always comparing ourselves to other people and what other people are doing or can do. So why do we do it? It's exhausting, I can tell you. By nature, we are sinful human beings. Our sin takes us away from the heart of God so we get caught up in the world and the things that the world offers. We are trying to find some external accomplishment, blessing, relationship, amount of money to satisfy the Jesus-shaped hole that can often exist. There aren't enough likes. If you don't know what likes are, it's a Facebook thing. There aren't enough followers. There aren't enough... There's not enough attention. There's not enough money. There's not enough praise. There's not enough relationships, good or bad. There's not enough makeup, hairdressers, evenings out. There's not enough stuff to fill that gap. Because it's a specifically shaped gap. That is why it is never a good idea to compare yourself to others. Comparison makes you inferior or superior and neither of those give any honour to God. The most important question we can ask ourselves is who or what is going to define my worth? One of the things that um, as a female pastor I struggle with in society is that I'm a female pastor and other churches don't understand and so they struggle with why I'm allowed to be a female pastor. Our church is over 150 years old now with female pastors right from the start but still I get confronted with this often and I once started to compare myself to male pastors. I'm not male to start with so that was already a flawed argument. And being a female pastor doesn't make me superior or inferior. It makes me a female pastor. It's all, there's nothing in it if I don't have that Jesus-filled gap filled with Jesus. There is no point to it. But when you are comparing yourself to great speakers or people who are always asked to do things in the church or in conferences, I don't ever want to be (laughs) running a conference, but you get the point, you start to diminish what Jesus can do in that gap because you're not comparing yourself to Jesus and living up to that standard but to what you think the world thinks you should be. I defined my worth very much by the fact that I'm not blonde when I was young. I used to be under the impression that blue eyes and blonde hair made you attractive Well, I don't have either of those things, not naturally. I'm short, I've got brown hair, like mud brown hair and brown eyes. And when I was a young person, I'm very much an outdoor person, so my hair, my skin and my eyes all seem to be one colour. And as much as I love having tannable skin, not a good idea, as it turns out. But I compared myself to all of the girls at school with the blonde hair and the blue eyes and I thought they were pretty. And I started to replace what I thought was what I needed instead of what I needed was Jesus. (coughs) So what defines your worth? The answer should be Jesus. If the answer is my job, my children, my husband, my wife, my parents, those things need to be shoved down a bit and Jesus brought to the top. That is who defines your worth. Chapter 12 of Hebrews says, Let us run the race with perseverance, the race marked out for us. Do you realise there's a race marked out for you? There's an expression I heard on telly once on an American TV show, two women having an argument about a thing, I don't know, it was pretty boring, until she said, Just get out of my lane. I'm like, ooh. 
that's pretty cool. Just get out of my lane. And then when I was reading this, I'm like, that's what happens when you try to run in someone else's lane. It's awkward. It's horrible. You don't fit there. That's not your race. There is a calling for you. There is a purpose for you, a mission for you and a lane for you that nobody else is in. It's just your lane. Because each one of us has been called according to the purposes that God has for us. A race to run that is marked out for you. Like the white lines that go around the school oval, that's the running track. You get over into someone else's lane, you're going to smash into them or they're going to smash into you. It's going to be ugly. Run the race that has been marked out for you, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. All that is required of us is that we stay in our lane, fulfil our purpose and do what, has, what we have been created to do. I am not an athlete. I even struggle <laughs> to walk for my own health. But I do understand that the fastest way to lose a race is to look to your left and right and see where everyone else is and what everyone else is doing. If you stay in your lane and keep your eyes on Jesus, you will be running the race that he has set for you and you will win that race and get that eternal reward. Paul says, so I run with purpose in every step. Every time I put a foot down, I'm running toward my divine purpose. Are you running towards your divine purpose? Or are you trying to help somebody in their lane where they don't really need your help, they need Jesus? Are you trying to find worth outside of the Jesus shape in you? Are you trying to compare yourself to others so you feel better? I don't want you to do that. You're great as you are. You've been created as you are with the gifts and talents that you have to fulfill the purpose that you have been given in your lane. The team are going to come and we're going to sing I'll Give Thanks. Perhaps today is a day where you can touch base with Jesus and ask him, are you still in your lane? Have you overstepped into somebody else's lane? Have you caused a traffic jam in your own spirit? Spending too much time worrying about what others have, how others live, instead of worrying about how you live and the impact that you have for Jesus is not doing you any favours and it's not what you're worth. As we sing this together this morning, take some time. If you feel like just listening to the music and the songs while you pray, that's fine. If you pray through singing, please feel free to do that. But take this opportunity to ask yourself, am I still comparing myself with others when I should be seeking out the way of Christ? So I'll give thanks to God 
when I don't have enough cause he's more than enough and he knows what I need yes he knows what I need in the silence I choose to believe working in the waiting though the future isn't clear to me I'll trust you anyway every breath I breathe an invitation to believe you are created Something good Though this season doesn't tell my story I know you move mountains for me You're just that good So I'll give thanks to God When I don't have enough Cause he's more than enough what I need so I'll give thanks to God when I don't have enough cause he's more than enough and he knows what I need yes he knows what I need Loving God, we come before you this morning asking for your forgiveness for the times where we have compared to humanity rather than striving for the prize that's found in Christ Jesus. Lord, may we continue to fix our eyes on you, the author and perfecter of our faith. And in all that we do, may we be able to sing those words, Why do I worry? He knows what I need. So we give thanks to you today and ask that you would continue to move amongst us and move in us as we do all that we can to bring the kingdom of heaven here to earth. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. Well, thank you, Debbie, for your message this morning. I was uh, quite challenged by a number of things that you said. We're going to um, conclude our service in just a moment, but before we do, I wanted to just bring to your attention those who take the word for today. The new one, August to October, is here. So if you would like one, if you're part of our online family and you are wanting to receive a word for the d- today, make contact with us either in the chat pod or during the week in our office and we will make sure one is sent to you at to your house for those that are joining us online. But if you would like one, they're at the back um, and uh, they are provided for you free of charge 
and we will send them out to you as well in the same fashion. So if you would like to um, have a word for the today, they are available at the back. Um, Debbie has an announcement, which I don't know anything about, so I'm going to get out the road. I just wanted to um, bring your attention to the morning tea situation. We had it outside last week. We're not going to do that to you this week. You will be able... <laughs> don't laugh at me, Cathy. You'll be able to go next door. However, we do have to adhere to the isolation rules. So the tables and chairs, if you choose to sit, have been set out. Please don't add chairs to the chairs already at the tables because then we'll be in violation. So you can stand, of course. Um, Sanitizer will be available and um, Elsa and Alan will be um, controlling the food and the cups so that we don't have any problems. So just if you can be mindful that the chairs are where they are as according to the measurements and the regulations, if you add a chair to the table, we are then in violation. So it's difficult, I understand, and I do appreciate your patience while we're um, living through this strange world. Thank you. We're going to conclude our service this morning with a song that uh, we've had a number of times now, but uh, the words just seem to be able to uh, get deep within my spirit. And this is a faith statement for me. You're here moving in our midst, right? I'm not doing this, this life around me. I'm not doing it on my own. I'm not doing it disconnected from God, but I'm actually believing that he's moving amongst us. In the good times... We've had good days, haven't we? But he's moving in, in amongst us and ministering to us, healing us and comforting us in the tough times as well. It's not just, God is not a fair-weathered friend, right? He's there in the good times and in the tough times. And that's the reason we worship him. It's because he's a way maker, a miracle worker, a promise keeper, a light in the darkness. Why don't you join with Neil and the team as we sing this final song together. I invite you to stand. You are here Moving in our midst I worship you I worship you You are here Working in this place, I worship you, I worship you. You are here, moving in our midst, I worship you, I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you, I worship you, you are, you are, way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, you are, way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. I worship you. 
never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Never stop, never stop working. Never stop. As we leave this place today, I want you to know that our role within community to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth does not finish here. It does not finish here that we have a whole life, as Paul says in Romans, a whole life to live, bringing glory to God. Our whole lives are a living sacrifice. Our whole lives are worship to God. You are the salt of the earth, so go out. And sprinkle that salt across our entire world, bringing the God flavours of his kingdom wherever we go. You are the light of the world, Jesus says. So allow God to uncover his radiance in our lives so that we can shine the truth of his love wherever we go. And it goes on to say in, those, in that passage, let our light shine before others so that in everything that you do, in every conversation that you have, that you may be able to, see, people will be able to see God's light shining through you. To bring glory to who? Not to us, but to bring glory to him, our Father in heaven. So go from this place to love and serve him, bringing God colours and God flavours wherever you find yourself. Amen. God bless you each, friends. Have an amazing week.